terminal is black on white? How come my terminal is uh, black on white instead of white on black? Um, I did start out my career on a white text, or it was green text, literally the old green text on the black CRT monitors. And um, I have it reversed for a couple reasons. One, I think it's easier on the eyes. <clears throat> and two, a lot of modern stuff does syntax highlighting. Uh, and all I mean by that is um, is write the colors. <clears throat> and the colors, I believe, stand out better if you have a white, or even better, a slightly, I believe it's possible, I'm not sure, but it might be slightly off-white so that something that's pure white is even visible. Um, but I think the syntax highlighting is definitely more visible. Uh, certainly some of the defaults that these tools choose for you, and then short of going in and trying to customize it to make it look great on the other way around. Uh, it, this is just the path of least resistance. All right, so uh, I will give you an opportunity to ask questions again, as I, I did last time. Uh, I wanted to start off by talking about the wait list issue. <clears throat> there, I currently got, so I got the pushback on trying to add everyone to the course. Um, the fire marshal will get mad and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so they didn't like that. I've got an email out for those who have not been putting in the secret word for the videos. And I use that because if you aren't putting in the secret word for the videos, there's a good possibility that perhaps you've dropped the class uh, but haven't formally unregistered yourself. So I'm hoping to get a few withdrawals by following up on that. I should know more within 24 hours. <clears throat> so you should get a, an email from me. with If you're on a wait list, the informal wait list since there's no formal one, uh, you should get an email from me within 24 hours with me saying I was able to get you in. And if you do not get that email from me within 24 hours, I was not able to get you in. Uh, all, so for that, I apologize that I'm just hitting up against the administration. and There's nothing I can do about it. If uh, there's a, a few of you for whom being enrolled in the course isn't uh, super necessary and it's more, well, I just kind of need to learn C++ for my own edification or because I'm going to be doing such, such and such down the road. Uh, all of the videos are currently publicly available on YouTube, uh, so, if you, so you can follow along at home, so to speak. Um, and I, I welcome you to do that, and I'm happy to, to the extent that you want to go to office hours for an instructor for whom you don't have a course, I'm happy to give technical support to those who are just interested. Um, so that's the status of the wait list. If you hear from me within 24 hours, I'm getting you in. If you don't hear from me within 24 hours, I'm sorry, I can't get you in. Okay. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is the process you should be taking in this course. Some of you have done coding uh, or for whatever reason are just totally on the same wavelength as the computers that run our lives and are, are cruising along. Uh, but there are many of you who are struggling just because it's so new and there's a lot of alien stuff. So in starting and talking about that, I wanted to look at it from the perspective of that hexagon thing we did. And that, in fact, was my motivation for providing the hexagon thing because it, it is very realistic in the process, you, at least part of the process, you should be using and approaching the content to this course. Okay. So the first question is, how many of you wrote, I'm going to use the term wrote code even though you're dragging blocks, how many of you wrote the code and then finally hit run to see whether or not it drew 16 blocks correctly, or 16 hexagons? Did you expect the first time you hit run to see 16 blocks? That's what I'm getting at, right? So I, I showed it in that handout, it had a picture of 16 blocks. 
I'm hoping I don't see any hands. How many people threw out some blocks and said, this thing's going to crank out 16 blocks. Let me hit run and find out. My guess is nobody did that. How many people hit run after seeing it draw a line or maybe draw a line, do an angle and draw a line? My guess is more hands come up, right? And then you try a little more to get a single hexagon out. And you probably hit run somewhere between one and five times before you got a single hexagon or maybe 10 or 15 times before you got a single hexagon to go correctly. Yes, is this more accurately capturing how you all were approaching it? Okay. That is what you need to be doing in this course. So let me take assignment two as an example. In lab today, and for those uh, on the Tuesday-Thursday lab schedule, the Thursday lab is dedicated simply to supporting those who are working on assignment two. So if you've completed assignment two, you need not come on Thursday to lab. Uh, in lab today, there were several people who had written, I don't know, 20 or 30 lines of code, and were all ready to get out of Vim and type G++ to see what it did. Sorry. <laughs> I thought I had a vision there for a minute. Um, <clears throat> Yes, Dad, I'm coming. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> For those who are writing a ton of code and were ready to get out of the editor and try compiling it and see this thing, ask for two numbers and do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division, that is exactly the same thing as sitting down with that hexagon problem and throwing out a ton of blocks, hoping that when you hit that run button, 16 hexagons come out in a grid just fine. All right? Don't do that. Okay? You should be doing what you're doing with a hexagon problem, which is you should be taking baby steps. What does this do? Let me try it. What does this do? Let me try it. You should be writing 15, 20, well, I don't know how many. It's somewhere between 5 and 20 little test programs to see if you're able to get that thing to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. All right? Second thing, and, and I'll, I'll even walk you through a little bit of what that looks like. The second thing you need to be doing is you need to be going here, going to the assignments, going to the assignment two. You need to be hitting this content overview and quiz. Uh, for those of you who are in the Tuesday, Thursday lab, prior to Thursday, and taking a look at some of these resources and trying some of these things before you're hitting assignment two. All right. So this is my effort to try and scaffold, try and help you direct the kinds of things you should be doing before you sit down and do assignment two. I imagine that as much of your time will be spent cursing at Vim as it is actually trying these things. That's fine. You have to start somewhere. Start with my little script, if you want to call it that, and learn Vim by taking these baby steps before you go to assignment two and start doing the baby steps. It is a four unit course. It requires a lot of work, except, it, again, I caveat this with uh, accepting those who have some experience or for whatever reason are just grokking this stuff. The majority of you have never seen it. It's a little bit alien. You've got to be spending a lot of time outside of class doing this. Regardless of me saying this, I'm going to get people coming to lab weeks down the road where their first attempt at doing project three is to sit down, they type main, and then they raise their hand and say, what do I do now? All right. Please, please, please be doing some of this work outside of class. Remember, the attrition is one-third of you are going to drop out or fail. And it's all because you aren't doing a lot of work at a class. You aren't pounding away at this. It is a four, again, it's a four-unit class. It's, it's pretty, imagine your four, for those who are in the calculus sequence, the four units of calculus is pretty much a pain in the ass. They always assign one through 50 odds, night after night after night, right? It's a huge drag. You've got to be dedicating as much energy to this. All right. So, given that, and let me set aside these external resources and some things to try which you should be doing, were I to sit down and have to start doing assignment two, I 
I would first recall that I had done a program actually so I'd be a step behind this so modeling model I'm pretending to be you now uh, again I would have done all this but I don't want to model that so I, I come whoops I don't go there I go to the daily diatribe because you recall me typing a program I typed a whole bunch of crap last time ignore that the time before I did this first.cpp that was a little hello world program that's an excellent place to start what I would do is, is I would download it. I actually, maybe I would go ahead and I'd find it. That's actually my downloads folder. It's a whole different issue on you figuring out where this stuff is. I might copy it here, copy it here locally. First.cpp, let me look at it. By golly, there's a program. Let me, oh, I'm sorry. I was editing this, talking with someone else. Uh, I think that's what it was. So I'd look at it, say, yeah, that's what Todd did in class. Let me look up how to do this G++ thing. I'll do an LS. There it is. Uh, first, let me try running it in my current directory. I want to, and then, you know, a little clap of the hands. Yes, I've got the very basics. What I would do then, I would either have this up on a dear friend terminal window or I would print it out and I would try typing this exact program in from scratch myself why because I'm not very good with Vim and you need the practice and what better to practice with than something that you know is going to work when you do it correctly so I'm gonna again I'll have a separate window with that up Todd's first dot cpp so I'm going to follow along on my printout or on, on the other window that's open, and I'm going to start typing this. And I'm going to have, yeah, right, I'm, pre I'm pretending to be you. So yes, you have to close that. Not you, because you saw the error, right? So I'm going to type in some stuff. I'm going to type in G++, Todd's first, and I'm going to get all sorts of errors. Uh, I don't remember if I, I probably said this. Uh, there are times when you're going to get 30 errors. You need to get your scroll bar and scroll this thing up to where the first error is. Ignore everything that follows. The first error is on line one. And it's showing me that it's got a problem there. Yes, you're absolutely correct. I need that. So let me try again. I fixed that error. Let me try compiling it again. <clears throat> now it's saying it doesn't like line three, that it was expecting a semicolon. Well, that seems weird. Well, let me try that. And no, it doesn't like that. Now it's complaining about the open curly brace. So now I've got an issue where the compiler is not being very helpful to me. And you're going to find this over and over again. The compiler is very, very dumb. Sometimes it gives you useful information. Sometimes it doesn't. It almost it is almost always correct within one line of where the problem is. So it's saying the line the problem is on line four. Uh, what you need to do is go back to your notes, look at the code I typed in, go back to the screencast, go to those tutorials and those references in the assignment under content to try this at home and so forth, until you realize that what you need are a set of parentheses there. So now you try again, compile again, still a problem, you come back here, you need a semicolon there, I compile it, still doesn't like it and you do more head scratching until you realize I need using namespace standard. And I try doing it again. Ah, there it compiles. So I'm going to run it. Um, I don't recall if I talked about this. To compile a program is G++, the name of the source code, and then a lot of times I'm putting that dash O and then something afterward. If I This is what the name of the program is that I'm going to run after the dash O. If I forget to put the dash o, then it will always call it, always call it a dot out. That's for historical reasons. Uh, so I did not provide the dash o, so it is calling my program a dot out. I'm going to try running that, and it looks like it didn't do anything. But if you look really carefully, there's my high. Is that too low? Let me pull it up a little. Uh, let me run it again. There's my high right there. 
Uh, it's all crammed up against the prompt that's given back to me once it's done running the program. How can I fix that? A little more head scratching, maybe a post a piazza. And it's you have to be explicit if you want to have the line end, meaning that the next stuff to be output will be on its own line. I do that, I run it, and sure enough, so you see now the line has ended and the next thing to print out is on its own line. I'm making progress, okay? So this is me wanting to start working on assignment two. And note that I've gone into this editor, I've gone out of the editor, I've compiled probably 10 times in this last couple of minutes. Probably take you three, three to 10 times as long to do what I just did. You need to go through that process with something very simple until you're feeling comfortable with the whole thing. Now when it comes time to do assignment two, I go back to the, what I said about the hexagon thing. Do not try to make assignment two all fit inside here now. What is the smallest bit of code you can add for assignment two? Well, it said to ask a question. Please, I don't remember the exact text. It's something like please enter a number. Let me compile it, make sure it's working. It is working. I guess I could run it. And there it is. Please enter a number. All right. Huh? What is the first number? All right. What is the first number? First D. Right. I'll roll with it. Now, I, uh, I, my memory is I did not talk about CN in class. Uh, so the question is, how do I get input from the user? Look it up in those resources I provided. Ask on Piazza. Search the web. C++ user input tutorial. Or how do you get input from the user? Anything. Put it in Google. Look at those resources I provided. Ask on Piazza. It doesn't matter how you do it. You just got to hunt for this stuff. Okay. Some hunting is going to turn, uh, turn up that just as... C out is console. I think the C is console, console output. C in is console input. So I do this, and there are a number of issues here. I don't know, out of curiosity, let's just see what happens. Uh, it says, I don't know what X is. A little bit of hunting, aha. Uh, this gets back to Todd Singh. Before you can use it, you have to tell the language what it is. It has no idea what X is, so I have to tell it that X is an integer before I use it. Don't put it down here, that's after I use it. Put it before I use it. Try again, and now it is acting weird, more head scratching, asking on the discussion board, you realize that those chevrons have to go the other direction. Let's try it again. It's working, let me try running it. What is the first number? 67, looks like so far so good. All right, I'm not gonna go any further. This is how you need to be developing code in this class. Anyone who writes 30 lines of code before exiting out and typing G++ is doing it wrong. When we talk about if statements or loops, the first thing you should be doing is not doing the assignment that requires you to use loops. The first thing you should be doing is taking Todd's first.cpp, that little shell of a program that's almost nothing, and experiment with a loop. Create your own loop in there, right? And use it as a sandbox. Play with it a little bit before you try to use it in an assignment. Do you understand what it means to do a for loop? Write five, six, seven little programs until you go, yes, I get it now. I understand what it's doing. Now that I understand what this tool, now let me look at the assignment and see how I will use this tool that I just learned to solve this assignment. Okay? If you are... Uh, apprehensive about asking things on Piazza because you're embarrassed uh, in, in, I'll say, because everyone else says it, there are no stupid questions, right? Um, but even though I say that, people are afraid to ask stupid questions, myself included. I understand the situation. Piazza has a little button you can press to post your question anonymously. So everyone will think that that guy named Anonymous is really stupid. So feel free to ask anonymous questions, all right? Um, come to me at office hours, come to me at office hours, come to me at office hours. I see some people historically twice a week. I don't care if I see you four times a week. 
definitely use me as a resource. All right. That's my last lecture. The pace is going to start picking up in this course, so take to heart the first 10 minutes of the screencast. Watch it. Email it to your parents and kids. Say, look what Todd made us do. Um, any questions? So it can be about what I just talked about. It can be anything under the sun. Do you have any questions for me at this point? All right. Yes. Um, when I try and log in to Jaguar from home, I type in my username, SSH, everything, and then it pops up with my password, but it won't actually let me type anything. All right. So the issue is when you log in to Jaguar from home, if you're doing it from a terminal window like this, you would say something like T Gibson at Jaguar dot csuchico.edu. It asks for a password and I'm starting to type and it's not doing anything. Actually it is. Uh, you all are raised in a web world where you're accustomed to seeing little stars or bullets with each character you type in. Back in the old days the way they kept people from looking over your shoulder from seeing what you're typing in is to use uh, uh, text speak is it is not echoing those keystrokes to the screen. Those keystrokes are being input. And if I hit return, I did type in my keystrokes correctly. So it's not giving you it's not giving you any visual cues, but it is actually accepting all the keystrokes. It's just not echoing them to the screen. One of those instances where it doesn't give you feedback when you're doing Right. Yes. And uh, yes. Over and over again, you will find that this operating system, if you're doing it right, yeah. And this, this is a little bit different since this is a password and people looking over your shoulder issue, but. Uh, yeah, there's there's some truth to if you're doing it right, it's not showing you what you're doing. It's not giving you feedback. Do you still have a question? Yeah, for um, doing an assignment two for the C out, you have a bunch of uh, text that's being displayed in quotes, and then you have the variable that you want to display. In fact, you know, it keeps like going back and forth. Is there a shortcut to um, you know not having to use the, the less than the chevrons? Yeah, the chevrons constantly. Uh, so the question is when you're using C out, you're doing something like, oops, someone Jaguar, exit E, <laughs> all right. That's just have to figure. Yeah, I, I got the, uh, you know, I, it, Apple had it in their discount bin, the extra large Y keyboard. Um, yeah, so the issue is if I create um, I'm going to mix it up. A float fl equals 3.14. Uh, C out. Todd's pi equals. And then I do this. Cool, eh? Okay. And so, yeah, it, it's, it's burdensome because you're having to put these chevrons before everything. Is there any way to avoid that? In fact, I'd have more chevrons if I wanted to end the line here. Uh, the short answer is no. There's no way of, of avoiding it. As far as the compiler is concerned, uh, we'll talk about this more as the semester goes, and you won't, probably won't gain an appreciation for it until 2.11 or 3.11, but uh, it's very much a language of expressions. So to give you an expression that is not hard on your eyes if I say this is visually comforting to you and in, in that you, you understand it but note that I would what I would do is I would call this the addition operator and the addition operator is what I would call a binary operator meaning it's expecting two things one on each side of it and so this the official term is the insertion operator. The insertion operator is a binary operator like addition, meaning it's expecting two, uh, a thing on each side of it. So there is, just as 3 and 4 are being operated on by the plus to create 7, the C out and the Todd's pi are being operated on in order to spit some stuff out to the screen. And then what's happening down here is you have 7 and then it's 9.8 is being added to the 7. Uh, it turns out that I don't want to go too far down this road. The result, the result of 3 plus 4 is 7. The result of C out, Chevron, Todd's pi, the result of that expression is C out, which means that then C out works with FL, then C out works with cool A, then C out works with end line. Uh, the result of 3 plus 4 is 7. Then this plus is working with a 7 and a 9.8. 
Then this plus is working with a 16.8 and a 2. Uh, same idea. That, that's why they have to be chained together. It is, uh, it is a little bit cumbersome. And there's no doubt about it. Yes. How do you for a float? How do you like make it show a particular amount of decimal places? Ah, good question. So if I, um, I'm going to comment that out. Let's take a look at what this code does. Uh, let me choose a better example. Let me make this equal to 3. I can make it 3.0. It doesn't matter. Same thing. If I can say FL, uh, hang on. No, I'm going to do it this way. Mm, no, let me choose. Um, how about 10 divided by 3? It's not pi anymore, but let's look at what it does. 10 divided by 3, 0. All right. So it's three. The answer is three and a third. The threes can go on forever. The question is, how can I uh, change the precision of this output? So maybe I only want 3.3, or maybe I only want two threes. Uh, what you're seeing here is what it defaults to. How I would do this, so let me do this in the context of um, how I'd figure it out. I would say C++. I, I, I sympathize that what we have a, a little bit of an issue with is terminology. So you may not know the terminology of what to, to search for. So with that as a caveat that I just happen to know the, the terminology, I, I might do precision flow output or something like that. So the issue is precision. How many how many decimal places do I want to output? Float decimal places wouldn't it work? No, I guess we could. Float, let me see. C++ float decimal places. C++ floats in X. Let's see what this first link is. How can I set the amount of decimal places? Um, the, I don't know if you can all read that. Let me make it a little bit bigger. Your main problem is yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you say C out dot precision, oh, that's... I want to see, does it show me an example of use? Mm. You can try this. Uh, what this is saying is that, that you can say cout.precision and then you provide a number for how much precision you want. So let's, let's try that. So that particular reference isn't perfect because it's not giving me an example of usage. So maybe you have to go back and try the next one. Let me see if the next one is better about it. Yeah, here we go. This is showing me a different version. I could actually probably copy and paste that. Let me try copying and pasting it. I don't have a variable a, but I have a variable pi, so I can copy, paste, and then do a little editing. So I will do, I'm just going to paste that in there. And my variable is called fl. And let's set the precision to 20. And I'll comment this out, right? So I'm going to do a little testing. So this is another thing. When you see code like this, Go back to Todd's Hello World program. Nice little shell. Put your own code in there to experiment. Yeah, sandbox. If I was halfway through assignment two or whatever assignment and, and I wanted to figure out how to do with precision, then what I would do is I would set assignment two down and I'd get my tiny little shell program and I'd experiment in that. Yeah. Doesn't like that, so I come back here. Uh, 
question. I'm trying to find an easy answer. None of these are giving me quite the answer I want because I'm going to need that. Yeah, so I would have to hunt a little bit more in the resources to realize maybe this isn't working, so I might say C++ set precision. That would turn up a reference page that says you need to include another header file, which is the input-output manipulators, because these things are manipulating the output. That's where all that comes from. Uh, yeah, in case I, exactly. So I have using, na using namespace standard, so this is all redundant. I can get rid of that. It doesn't do any harm, but it's not required since I do have line four there. If I set precision to two, I compile it, I run it, and there it is. Again, I have it, uh, I have no end line there, so that's why I'm getting my prompt back right on the heels of it but you can see it works. Anyway, it, wa it wasn't a perfect example for me to pursue, but I'm trying to give you the idea. When you want to figure out something, Google it. Right? Look at more than one answer that comes back. Uh, read. If you read a little bit, you go, oh, maybe this term would be better, and you read Google with slightly different terms. This is what, this is what you have to be doing to solving problems. All right, All right next question. <coughs> Nothing? Yes? I noticed in Vim, they had it where when you press enter, went to a new line, it auto-indented it. If there's like a semicolon open there, is that a setting you can set to do that? Or? Uh, yes. So I think that if you ran, when you when you all got logged on to Jaguar and you did uh, tilde T Gibson bin helper, uh, what that was doing was that was me setting up a little bit of your environment, including Vim. Let me just get on to Jaguar real quick and confirm that I did set that. Um, yeah, so I did put a setting in there for auto indent. So if you ran this in Jaguar, then that would make sure that you're auto indenting correctly. Uh, if you have your own computer, and you want to get your environment set up the same way that I set up everyone's on Jaguar, the command will be s copy your ID, not mine. So let me do your Jaguar ID at jaguar.csuchico.edu colon. Hang on, I want to try and. Ah. Hello. Mm, now I've really done it. This isn't looking good for me selling computer science on the crowd here. Okay, computers are wonderful, really. This doesn't want to happen to me often, not more than once a day. You'll like it. All right. Hello. <laughs> okay, watch this. Voila, problem solved. <laughs> It'll be secure. Let me make that a tiny bit bigger. All right. Secure copy your ID at jaguar.csuchico.edu colon tilde T Gibson bin helper space dot. So this means you want a secure copy uh, from, from Jaguar. You, you, you can't connect to Jaguar without having an account on it. So you're going to connect using your account. It'll prompt you for a password. And what this is doing is it's from, from my binary directory, it's going to copy this file called helper and it's going to put it in your current directory wherever you are on your own machine. Okay? And then after you, you do that, <clears throat> I guess I can do it. Secure copy, I happen to be myself, coincidentally enough, so I'll use my ID. Uh, I'm also on campus, so I don't need the csuchico.edu. Colon tilde t gibson bin helper 
and I'm going to copy it into my current directory, ask for my password, and then if it works correctly, it'll come up with this. Um, this is a little status thing. If you copy a huge file, you'll see this number slowly increase. Now, how do you run it? You can type, uh, actually, let me look at something. I'm not sure if it's going to do it. Yeah, it should do it automatically. So you can just say, in my current directory, I want to run helper. And that'll do it locally for you. Uh, among the, so it gets the auto indenting in there. It also gets the All right. Uh, so among the things is the auto indenting, which means when I open up a new line, I'm going to start indented there just fine. It's going to put the line numbers that you see on the left side here. Uh, and it does a couple other settings just to make life easy for you. Other questions? Oh, yeah, secret word, thanks. Um, the secret word. Antediluvian. I don't know, you're impressed with my vocabulary, aren't you? It means uh, humorously, outrageously out of date. So if I came in here with back the, the very first laptop I had, and it would have been while I was in high school, so I should probably say that my father had or bought that I used, was a compact portable. And it was um, about, this, about this wide, this thick, this high, had a big handle on it, weighed, I don't remember exactly, at least 20 pounds. And you'd lay that beast up and then you could click and a keyboard would come out and there'd be a, there was a screen about this big. <laughs> and then to the right of it were a couple floppy drives, the, the old five and a quarter inch floppies. And uh, if I came in and was working with that, I would be working with my antediluvian laptop. Okay. Yes? Can you pull the It's right there. Oh, let me, let me blow it up a little bigger. Whoa, all right, hang on. Yes. Kind of a basic question, but can you explain the process just the just the process that I've been kind of rifling through. Yeah. All right. Uh, so the process is called um, a uh, edit compile test process. So the to edit, I'm going to type vim myfile.cpp to compile. So here I would type this, and then let me say when done, I would probably do colon wq, right? That's going to get me back to my, my prompt. To compile, let me do this. To compile, I would say g myfile.cpp o my file. Again, you can call the executable whatever you want. And then to test is in the current directory, I want to run my file. And one of two things will happen. If this uh, 
if this does not work correctly, then what you're doing is you're doing compile, edit, compile, edit, compile, edit until this thing does not return any information. It just gives you another prompt, which again means it worked just fine. And then at that point, you'd go to test. And now you, it doesn't work quite right. And then you go to edit, compile, test, edit, compile, test, edit, compile, test. Yes? Uh, let, why would something compile properly to, but not test properly? Like when his numbers were squished up at the very beginning of his line. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, that's a, that's it, it. right. So, so it'll run, but it's not giving you the results you would expect. And that can be anything from a typo in your message to uh, like you have to. So, let me give you an example. <clears throat> a different example. See out, give me your first number. And then you say CN X. All right? And then so you create an integer X for that. And now you need to get the second number. So what you do is you uh, and I you copy and paste, right? Everyone likes to copy and paste to save time. And so I change this to second and I change this to Y. And now if I compile this, let me comment out all that stuff. If I compile this, it's going to compile just fine. And let me add some more out. See out, first number is, second <coughs> number is, and I want to print out X, and I want to print out Y. Okay. Let's see if this compiles just fine. It does. Let me run it. First number is 23. Second number is 45. So it compiled just fine, but it did not run the way I expected it to. And if you look closely, I create an integer X. I get that from the user, I create an integer y, but whoops, I've got a copy and paste error here. I forgot to change that x to a y, so I just got x twice in essence and never did anything with y. This, this type of error here, and I'd call this a bug. So if your program doesn't compile, that's not a bug. When you hear of bugs, bugs is when your program compiles fine, but it doesn't run correctly, right? Uh, every, at 111, you start thinking, oh, you know, it's so miserable just to get the program to compile. Actually, you get over that by the time you're done with 111. The rest of your computing career until you retire, all of your debugging woes are going to be with programs that compile fine and you have an error in, in how they're running. Compiling and ends up being the easiest part of the problem. <clears throat> uh, I do want to say one last note on submitting assignments. When you submit assignments, I want the CPP file, the source code that you're typing in Vim. I do not want a.out or any of this stuff that I haven't read. I don't want a.out. I do not want first. These are what the compiler creates. I don't care what the compiler creates. I want to see what you created, right? So if, if you're doing it in Vim, that's what I want. We can resubmit them, right? You may resubmit as many times as you like. I take the most recent submission, yes. All right, any questions? Then uh, I'm going to let you go a couple minutes, and we'll see you either on Thursday or Friday.